Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Janet Lambert, the CEO of the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Cell and Gene Investor Day. We have a terrific agenda today of speakers and panels and company presentations, um, but I'm gonna take just a few minutes here at the beginning to set the stage for those conversations by giving you an overview of the global cell and gene sector and reviewing some of the key developments in the sector for 2018. So consider it a special bonus for those of you who, who arrived on time. So um, uh, the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine is the host of today's event. And for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we are an international advocacy organization dedicated to realizing the promise of safe and effective regenerative medicines for patients around the world. We have more than 300 members. Um, those members are primarily small and large companies, but about 25% of the membership are nonprofit institutions, universities, research institutions, patient advocacy groups, and the like, which makes us a particularly powerful voice for the sector. Um, our work is really focused on achieving a few key things. Um, first, clear, predictable, and to the extent possible, harmonized regulatory pathways for regenerative medicine products, uh, enabling market access and reimbursement policies that make uh, this a viable business for therapeutic developers. We are addressing the industrialization and manufacturing hurdles of the space. We do a great deal of stakeholder outreach and communication, some of which I'll show you in a minute, which is a set of data that we collect on the sector. And then we, through events like these and others, work to maintain uh, access to capital. So um, ARM convenes, connects, and advances the sector. Um, you can see from this list, I will not read this list for you, but this is a list of the membership. Um, public companies are in bold. And really, I think what we're trying to show is that most of the key players in this space are around the table, whoops, working together to try to solve industry-wide problems. Now, on to the overview. So, ARM has a data partnership with Informa, and through that partnership, we track regenerative medicine companies around the world. Currently, that curated database has 906 companies, as you can see, the majority of those are in North America, about a quarter are in Europe and Israel, and about 15% in Asia. We're tracking 100 and, uh, sorry, 1,028 clinical trials in the space presently, 30, 341 in phase one, 595 in phase two, 92 in phase three. That phase three number incidentally is up 12% over last year. And if you're interested in the breakdown by technology type of these trials, 362 are in gene therapy, 362, not a typo, just a coincidence, also in gene modified cell therapy, 263 are cell therapy, and 41 are tissue engineering. These trials aim to enroll over 60, 000, nearly 60,000 patients. Looking at this by phase, you can see that if the targets are met, we could soon have 20,000 patients enrolled in phase three clinical trials in this sector. The number of clinical trials is anticipated to grow significantly. This is data from the FDA for gene therapy only, but it makes the point, and you can see here, that the FDA has approved nearly twice as many trials in calendar year 2018 compared to 2017, and 2017 was a significant increase over 2016. So turning from trials to financings, in 2018, we saw $13.3 billion invested in this sector, up 73% from the prior year. 
looking at that by technology type, that's $9.7 billion in gene-based therapies, up 64%, 7.6 billion in cell therapies, also up 64%, and about a billion in tissue engineering. Just a note about the math here, um, we put gene-modified cell therapies are included in both the gene-based therapy category and the cell-based category in the breakdown, which is why these numbers don't add to the total. If we look at total financings by type, you can also see that 2018 surpassed the previous two years in every category, sometimes substantially. Corporate partnerships were up 55%, private placements 89%, follow-ons 18%, IPOs, obviously a huge year with IPOs, up 659%, and venture capital up 101%. It's also worth knowing that, uh, noting that even though it's not shown on this chart, 2015 was previously the best year for IPOs in this space at 1.6 billion, and 2018 exceeded that significantly at 1.93 billion. We also had a number of record-setting venture capital raises, and I'll show you some of the specific transactions that make up these numbers in a minute. On the M&A front, obviously, it was a very big M&A year, driven primarily by the Celgene Juno and Novartis Avexis transactions. Here are some of the details that I mentioned. In 2018, we saw five corporate partnerships with upfront payments, over $100 million. Private placements and venture were very active and sizable in 2018 with 12 companies with raises between 100 and 300 million. That led by Allergene with their 300 million raise, which was obviously followed then by a successful IPO later in the year. In public financings, we saw 11 firms raise more than $200 million in initial or follow-on offerings. And as you can see, Bluebird led the way with more than $1.2 billion raised in the year. So overall, it was a remarkable year for financings in 2018. To close, I wanted to highlight for you the next wave of expected product approvals, like Kim Raya, Yesgarda, and Lexterna. These therapies are showing some tremendous results in clinical studies. Here we're showing those products we anticipate will be approved this year. The first seven we anticipate to be approved in 2019 and the latter two in 2020. Just to say a bit about these, the Enzivent Therapeutics product for Complete de George is likely to be the first RMAT designated product to come to market. This product treats of ultra rare disease where currently without treatment most patients die by age two. Their preliminary clinical data has survival rates past age two of 70%. The Avexis Novartis therapeutic similarly treats a very uh, a rare but also awful disease, which generally um, results in patients dying by the age of two. Uh, the preliminary studies for that Avexis product treated 15 children, all of whom were alive after age two on the treatment. So this is what makes us so excited about this space. Obviously, we're excited about the financings and the clinical trials but ultimately we're about getting these products to patients and these transformative clinical results are really what I think is providing the steam for this whole sector. So with that, um, oh, just a note before I hand things over, um, for those of you who might be interested in this presentation, these charts, 
or additional data that ARM keeps, you can find that at the ARM website, along with quarterly sector reports. Um, we keep a list of near-term clinical and significant data readouts there, if you'd like to track that, is also available to you. Um, previous presentations, we do a, a weekly sector newsletter that rounds up clinical policy and business news in the sector that's available for you, as well as commentary from experts in the field. So all of that is available to you. So thank you for your attention.